Obviously, there's been quite a bit of development in the assessment itself. I'm going to spend a little time just going through, pointing out issues and features that we've got within the, the uh, practice tests that have been that have been delivered. And, and obviously, I'll take questions as well uh, on any observations that you might have had while you've been you've been looking at those. Um, and then towards the end of the session, I'll just give you a quick update on what you can be expecting to see from us, from SEMA Learning, uh, in terms of support, materials, and, and, and so on, over the coming weeks. All right? So this will be a, a very, very quick uh, run through the, um, the, the, the slides just now. Um, I think, you know, as our thinking has developed, in, in terms of the teaching and development side, the competencies become more and more important. You know, uh, at, at launch and in development of the syllabus, we thought, well, this is, you know, it's, it's a quite nice, tidy way to, to categorize what we've done with the, the syllabus, where we've moved subjects from uh, management to operational and, and you know, all around the syllabus, one or two things from pillar to pillar. It, did, we we're reminding ourselves that everything has been done on the back of this competency framework. And the competency framework was driven by people who are going to be employing our students and, and hopefully our past finalists. All right? So we, we, the, the message of making people business ready is stronger than ever. And it's something that as we've thought about, particularly I think in the case studies, we've got a clearer understanding of the case studies, then the, the importance of this, this framework is more and more strong. Now this is where there is one, the, the change that I was thinking of. Um, if, if you look through some of the material, the, the later material that supports uh, the, the, the syllabus, the top two skills, the top two competencies have been slightly retitled. So core accounting and finance skills we're now referring to it as technical skills, and business acumen is business skills. Um, the latter one, I think, is really quite cosmetic, just so that everything is a skill. Um, <laughs> and the core, the core accounting and finance, quite, quite an important one, um, is that we, I say we've changed it to technical skills because the, the phrase core accounting and finance makes you think of debits and credits mm -hmm. and reconciliations and numbers, yeah? Whereas as actually what is in there is our entire syllabus, really, the, the, the indicative syllabus content. So knowing about a SWOT analysis or what goes into SWOT analysis and quarters by forces and so on are, are the technical skills that we've got in there. So that, as I say, it's, it's largely cosmetic, but I think it's just there to, to help clarify what counts for what when we're looking for marks. Yes, I need to rename the other two competencies. People skills and leadership skills. Because the influencing people and the leading are kind of the same thing. Uh, the definitions of leadership are always says to influence people. Yeah, the, the, it might be that they call it well uh, people or something like that. The, the, the people skills is um, communication and it is influencing people and it's um, persuasive skills, negotiation skills, uh, and, and leaders, even leadership of people as you say, whereas leadership skills is of the, of the organisation. Now of course an organisation is largely driven by its people, but it, it, it's also looking at the strategic direction um, and, and broader skills than that. So, so the, there's no plans to change that. They, they are defined, and again, actually the content of them is, is not changed. This, this was um, changed in, in consultation with AICPA, so we've now got the CGMA competency framework, which is, is in, in that drove the, the name change. But uh, in our document here, so the <coughs> core accounting financial skills, the business accurate, so I'll just read out here, People skills, ability to influence, negotiation skills, decision making, collaborative working, and communication. Leadership skills, team building, and I see your point, that crosses over with 
uh, people, coaching, mentoring, driving performance, change management, the ability to motivate and, and inspire. Um, they're, they're all the sort of top down components to people skills, whereas the people skills is sideways, upwards, downwards um, as, as well. Okay, so um, yeah, it's, it's not a massive change, it's not a massive change, but it does just give a little bit more clarity as to uh, where things within the syllabus and within the tasks that students are going to do uh, falls. And remember, this, this whole framework is not just to drive the syllabus. Um, you, you, you will be hearing more as in, I think the final stages of arguing are going on about the, the practical experience requirements um, and, and those are going to be framed within these competencies. Uh, professional development is going to be driven by competencies as well. So that the whole lifelong learning uh, piece falls within the, this, um, this, this diagram. Right, so a slight, a slight change in there, but it, it doesn't affect, you say, the content of the pages of the, the syllabus document. Um, now, I think we, we, we went through these, and, and hopefully, um, within the practice test, you, you're getting some idea of how these, these topics um, have been integrated into the exams, as well as where they've come up within the, the pillars or within, within the, the subjects. All right, so the, these were the big things that we thought were, were coming through. Again, the, the other thing I just want to make um, clear, as you've reviewed the syllabus and seen what's happening you know, maybe to the topics that you teach and the levels that you're teaching at, you know, we, we said back in February, I think, give an indication, it's about an 85% change, so 15% change, 10 to 15% change in where the content of the syllabus lies. Yeah? And we could have just changed the syllabus and refreshed and said, look, E2 is losing this and it's been replaced with that, and P2, and done nothing else. All right? Um, so what I've been picking up on uh, meetings and visits to colleges and, and events with students, I don't think there's anything really to be scared of in terms of the difficulty that there is within our syllabus. And the, uh, you know, everything is relevant, people can see why, um, knowing about this and, and, and of course everything that remains within the syllabus is important to a candidate for a, a, a role within management accounting. Okay, so you know, you, you see those, hopefully uh, you've, you know, you, you've got a, an idea on the content that's in there. However, the, the bit that so I've been, I've been able to see people gradually come to understand more and more um, is it's very very slight on this diagram listen, but it's these dotted lines in here and, and, and when, when I was when I was here before you know so I, I spoke to you about the, the progression rules you know how students will go through the qualification and how it's no longer possible for them to study E1 and E2 at the same time, or attempt the exams at the same time, which a lot of people seem to want to do within the current within the current qualification. I can understand why they want to do that. But we've put this, you know, it's a very thin, but thin dotted line. I think it should be a hard, hard barrier to, to make it clear that look, what we've done is to create these levels and, and we've mapped them to a uh, levels of employment within organisations. Yeah, we've gone back to the research that we said, yeah, uh, uh, when we were doing the research, we said to, to people, to, to the employers, if you've got somebody in your organisation with one or two years experience, what do you expect them to be doing? Yeah? So what do you want them to do within a, a financial management accounting function? So we've come up with these job roles. And if I've got the right one, yeah. So this this is this is more than just a, how how hard are topics within the syllabus at this level. It's much more than that. Yeah, it's it's saying that an individual who is and yeah, we've created this job title of finance officer. 
they need to know quite a lot about it. They need to do a lot of, yeah, there is no more crunching in there. Yeah, P1 and F1, it is quite heavily based on calculating variances and, and preparing financial statements, doing cash forecasts, etc., etc. You know, there is a lot of that. They do need to understand what's going on, but not to a huge degree because they're not driving the strategy of the business. But they need to appreciate that um, you know, if the business is seasonal, then cash flow forecasts will have highs and lows. That's what business acumen or business skills are. <coughs> okay? But the main thing that I think has, has sort of developed in people's understanding over the last few months of this is the integration across the three pillars. And to say that if we make a short-term decision about spending cash on a new piece of equipment, then that's going to have an impact on our cash flow forecasting, which is within the F. And we need to think about whether that expenditure on the piece of business is actually supporting the overall direction of the organization which we're looking at in E. Yeah? So so th this is something which we, we've, we've had various discussions with other um, accounting bodies since we've launched the syllabus. We've had people challenging what we're doing and um, <coughs> being a little bit rude actually, from time to time. But we've been able to give as good as we get because you know, even looking, you know, we, we can criticise ourselves at this level to say that if somebody is doing the current qualification, you know, why are they doing E1 and E2 together? Why are they doing things at two different levels? We've encouraged that. We've said, look, there's flexibility in the qualification, but really, should you be doing, you know, advanced anything before you've shown that you can master the basics? There's one criticism in there, right? The other criticism of what we've got just now is that if you look at the, the current F1 financial operations subject, that's, that's got this clear, defined little box that everything sits within. And it's basic financial accounting. It's to do with you know, smaller and medium-sized organizations. Look at the P1, it's not consistent with what's going on in the F1. With the P1, you've got long-term you know, present value decisions, uh, as well as variance analysis and things. Now, the, all, these, all these subjects are vital tools for the management accounting. But there isn't a consistent thread that sits across each of the levels that we can say, here's a definition, where, where things are just now. So we can be critical where we have been, critical of ourselves, which is really great because that's what's brought change about. But we can also defend ourselves against challenges that are made by other um, accounting bodies. So yeah, we, we could take a challenge from say a large global general purpose accounting body, I won't name its name. <laughs> <laughs> and say, you know, so in your middle level, you've got some law, some management accounting, some tax, some financial reporting, some financial management, and some auditing. Now what's the story there? Is there, is there a story? Who's going to be doing those six disciplines? Yeah? What's the point in having that level defined as a level? They say it's, it's a different body, it's a general purpose uh, accounting body. Yes, there's all these different things that somebody might be doing. <coughs> but, but our response on this is actually, we've spoken to employers, and this is what we want people to be doing. This is what they want people to be doing. Right? So we want to see how enterprise can integrate with performance and can integrate uh, with financial. Uh, pillars, financial topics, okay? and we can say at the end of that, yes, there's distinction between what the, the tools in the E box are and the P box and the F box, but the final picture is one that says this person is 
and we're using the phrase business ready for this level. Okay, so that that's a bit, that's, a, that's a very very strong message, and and where it's at its strongest is clearly when we come on to talk about the case study where we are asking people to integrate everything that they've learned. All right. And we've had quite a bit of fun with this idea of integration and, and case studies and so on, all right, to, to, to see what we're doing. And it, there's actually a, a, a um, so I'll just I'll go past these because these are the, the donuts that you've seen before. They're all there in the, in the syllabus. And again, you, you've seen this before, but like we've we've had a we've had a fair amount of fun with with sort of explaining the levels to people, and it it's really helped me in terms of my thinking if I were putting a course together um, on what a student needs to know and when, right? Because there, there would have been a temptation to say, look, let's let's just let's just say forget the case study. Let's just think, somebody needs to concentrate on E. So I'll get my E tutor, my E1 tutor, to come in and to spend a period of time, six weeks, whatever it may be, just talking about E1 and saying, this is what you'll need to do, and these are the types of questions that you'll have to answer, and they're objective testing, so some of them, you know, there's hot spots, there's drag and drop, um, and there's, there's um, you know, the, the multiple answer questions and all the rest of Sorry, I'm laughing. I have to I have to pronounce drag and drop ever so carefully <laughs> because I was quoted and luckily I saw the I saw the draft before it was published, but I was quoted by um, PQ magazine talking about types of questions, how objective testing is not just multiple choice. And I, I said, you know, there's this this and there's drag and drop. And it come out as dragon. <laughs> so just some image of the problem. A fire breathing animal has to be dropped on the right answer. Anyway. Uh, anyway. Now, you know, that is. It, it's an approach which, uh, you know, I don't know how much of my background you remember, but I used to run the courses, the SEMA courses at, at DPP, and I made no bones about what I did at DPP. And it was, it was exam, it was exam training, it was coaching, it was making sure that people had just about enough, or more than just about enough, to to answer the questions in the exam. And if I was teaching P2, I didn't know if the student was going to be doing F2 at the same time or an E1 or whatever. And, and quite frankly, I didn't care. I was saying, right, in this exam, there's a 25 mark question. I'll show you how you can get 15 marks. All right? Very, very exam focused, as the training for that exam or coaching towards that exam. And there's a temptation that people continue with that when you look at this part here and say, you know, I'm the, I'm the P2 tutor. I don't know whether you've done E2 or F2 yet. I don't really care because I'm trying to get you through the, the P2 exam. Now, that, that there's still some value in that, but I have to open my horizons just a little bit. Because now, when I'm teaching, think of a topic that's in P2, uh, when I'm teaching long-term decision-making, net present values and discounted cash flow and so on, yes, I want the student to be able to answer questions on that topic. Multiple choice questions, objective questions, drag and, drag and drop <laughs> questions, um, and, and, and so forth. But the only way I can get somebody to really appreciate that is to say, look, the big picture is, this type of question that we used to have in the 2010 syllabus, which would have earned 16 marks or something like that, yeah, because a, a, an objective test question may just be about one of the, the roles that goes into doing a net present value calculation. Yeah, how do you in, incorporate inflation? What would these numbers be if we incorporated inflation into the cash flows? There's a simple or straightforward uh, Objective test question, right? 
I'm not going to teach that on its own. I'm going to teach that in the bigger context of doing discounts of cash flow. Right? So I mean, that still remains. That's, that's how I'm going to teach P2. Pretty much the same as I've always taught P2. Right? Which is good news for me. Because I don't need to write a whole new set of notes. Right? <laughs> Maybe just a few practice questions at the end. Well, I always did have objective test practice questions. I would start off a morning. I should have done it with you guys this morning, didn't I? I said, let's see how much you remember from February. Here's a, a, ten, a ten item objective test. Right? So, so, so no, that, that doesn't make life harder for me moving into the, the new, uh, the new, the revised syllabus. Um, yes, I've got to bring in topics that were previously in P1 or F3 or whatever they were. Um, but it doesn't change my approach to, to teaching those topics. But when I've gone through and given uh, illustrations on discounted cash flow, but again, I want my students to understand the context. It's not good enough just to be calculating, because I've seen that there are going to be objective test questions that, under, that, that, that test their appreciation of the usefulness of that technique. So now I'm going to say, well, if the result is positive, why might I have reservations about going ahead with this particular proposal? Yeah? Um, and, so, and the sorts of things that we would have had in the discussion parts of the questions. Now, where are those things going to be? Yes, there may be objective test items in there, but this sort of stuff is going to come up in the, the case study. In a case study, it's entirely possible that I open a task and my boss has said, look, one of your colleagues has prepared this discounted cash flow exercise. Now, I've got to take this to the board, but can you give me a, a highlight <coughs> summary on the, the advantages and disadvantages of this, um, of this exercise? Now, I could talk about advantages, disadvantages of preparing the numbers and risks that there's mistakes and sensitivity analysis and uh, all the sorts of stuff that goes in there. But I can also talk about the overall strategic business context, stuff that's there in the e-pillar. Yeah? And I can talk about the impact on the financial statements of making a big investment that generates low profits in the early years and how return on capital employed will suffer. Things that are in the e-pillar. All right. So when I'm when I'm going to be teaching my my P2 course as an example, I will have to have one eye on the longer distance. The fact that at some point, as I said, you know, the big thing with these levels is they do link together, and it actually does matter that a, a, a student is they may have they may have already taken E2 before you're teaching them P2. Yeah, or they may be yet to do that, but you still should be able to communicate to them that there are issues that sit outside this particular uh, objective test exam. Right, so that, that, that thinking is sort of, you know, it, it's developed, it's, it's not really, uh, you know, earth shattering that, that we need to do this. And, and yes, people will be able to teach towards E2 on its own and get really, really good pass marks for E2. But if you delay any of, of this awareness of the bigger picture until you come back and, and, and the, the students are now ready to take the case study, I think you're making life difficult for yourself or, or your colleague who's going to be teaching the case study. So you've got to decide now. Do you like that colleague that's teaching the case study? <laughs> <laughs> How often do they make you a cup of tea? <laughs> and after the case study course, do you want to accept cups of tea from them? <laughs> Ones that have been made with four tea bags and 17 sugars and things like that. <laughs> so it's, it, 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 is a big, it is a big issue. And the, the other thing I would say about this uh, teaching or teaching in the case study or teaching at the level. So before, I, I don't know how, how many case of the practice exam case studies you've had a look at. You know, I don't, I don't expect a thorough, thorough analysis of them. 
that before you go into a course, I think it's useful, whether it's E2, P2, F2, whichever subject it is, just to sit people down for an hour and say, here's a case study that you will eventually do. You might have one, two, or three subjects to go at this level. Once you've got these three subjects out of the level, this is the type of task that you'll be doing. Yeah? Because everyone is going to be scared about case studies, operational management particularly, because it's an alien concept. I think, I think students at strategic level, you know, currently at strategic level or just going into strategic level, they know that their next steps, if we hadn't changed the syllabus, would be three exams, then a case study. So they're probably not too frightened by what's happening. But at management and the operational level, then there is going to be concern. We accept that. We know it. But if you can show them the case study before starting your E1, E1, P1, or F1 teaching, and say, look, this is all it is. You're in an office, and somebody's come in and giving you information, and a little bit of news, and they want a response. And if you look through these case studies, they're not asking you to explain the reasoning why IAS2 has got this disclosure and that and whatever. They're putting you in a business context, and it takes us back to this, or whichever level you're at. Yeah? It's it. You are going to be putting things together in a business scenario where you're communicating with colleagues or giving instruction to other people, where you're starting to you know, delegate and, and, and lead the business, where you're understanding the business. Yeah? So, so, wherever you're at in, the, in your teaching, appreciating the, the rationale of the levels, and appreciating how the three boxes, the E, the P, and the F, look, those are just essential tools that, that you have to have to be able to do that big task at the end, the case study at the end. One of the analogies that I've used, but I've been sort of explaining the rationale well away from accountancy and business, is to do with cooking preparing meals and saying that we're going to go through a course of study and the end of the course of study is going to be uh, that you prepare a meal. Now, it may be a meal for a dozen people, it may be a meal for 50 people, it may be a family meal, it may be a formal meal. Right? We don't know that one yet, but that's going to be our case study. Could be my birthday meal. <laughs> 29th of December. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big one this year. <laughs> last year. Last year, when it was my birthday, my kids were in a tennis tournament. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, lots of parents hanging around in the side. And I brought cakes in. And uh, I said, right, kids, okay, happy birthday from me. And, um, <laughs> and somebody said, so I said, oh, which birthday is it? And I just said, throw away comments, I said, oh, it's my last birthday. As in, I'm not counting from that, was what I meant. <laughs> I'm not going to give it to I've got to 49, I'm not going to count anymore. So I said, I said it's my last birthday. And one of the, the tennis mums sort of looked at me and went, oh, Do you want a seat? You know, like, <laughs> and, and it took me ages to tweet that I'd kind of implied that I was going to die sometime in the next few months. But anyway, I'm not. Um, so, anyway. So sorry, that, that, that's, that's by the by. The, um, so, so, you know, I've got this big meal. And I, I, I'm, you know, I'm giving you plenty of time to, to learn how to cook to prepare this meal. But I've not told you, you know, who I'm inviting or anything like that. But I know there's, there's three things, just to keep it consistent, there's three things that you need to be able to do to prepare a good meal. You need to be good with meat and fish, you need to be good with vegetables, and I like my desserts. So I'd like to have a, a nice you know, cake or maybe a pudding. I don't know yet, not decided. Okay? So you go away and you learn about meat and fish on one course. And you become very, very good at meat and fish. 
Then you go away and you learn about vegetables and salads on another course, and you can pay very good at those. And then separately you go away and you learn about the, the, the desserts. So you've got these you've got these three distinct sets of skills, these three sets of tools that you can work with. But when you're when you're learning about meat and fish, somebody's going to be saying to you, you know, and this this uh, this type of fish goes really nice with this type of vegetable. And, then in the vegetables, this type of vegetable complements that. And if you've had these for your main course, then your dessert has to be light or heavy or sweet or whatever. Okay, so, so you're aware that they fit into a big picture. But then the idea of the case study is, you know, with, with a couple of weeks to go to the big party, I say, oh, here's the, here's the accepting list. And, um, she doesn't eat fish. He's got a nut allergy. This, this, and this. Now, you've got enough skills developed through these three boxes to be able to go away and say, right, now I know what I can do. So I'll avoid this, I'll do that, I do that, it goes with the other, I add those two together, then the third thing has to be within this category. Yeah? So that, that's been my analogy throughout, you know, saying, like, right, yeah, stand side, you big belly, talk about food. Um, but it, it, it's something that, that you know, I, I think you know, if you take it away from the accounting and the fear of, 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 of the context, all you're saying is you, you, there's probably loads of other analogies that, that you've got to learn some basics, and it's best learning them in isolation before you put things together. But when I talk about learning in isolation, you still have an idea that there's a goal at the end, and the goal is a big, a big meal or whatever it may be. Yeah, it's the same. It's the same in management as well. Um, is, is, there, is there an emphasis on any type of, of on any subject? There isn't. There isn't. Um, and this is where the integrated part of it comes in. It, there's, there's three things that can be integrated. There can be within one subject, one learning outcome integrated with another learning outcome. All right, so in, in the E subjects there are there's human resource and there's um, conflict resolution and there's change leadership, you know, so that they can all be integrated w within E. Then you've got um, subject to subject, E to P to F, that can be integrated. So uh, you make a decision, what's the impact on financial statements? You make a decision, what's the impact on required financing? Um, that's a, a fairly obvious one, I think, um, and the links to the strategy and so on. So they can all be integrated within a task. Then the other bits that could be integrated. Sorry? Sorry? It's completely Yeah. Oh, now this is just something, something else. I'll mention this in a moment. So, so, so the, the third thing that might be integrated is technical and business skills, business and people skills, business and leadership skills, and so on. So the, the actual skills that are being displayed when responding to, to a task. Uh, and you know, th th those are the ones that are probably least easy to see. Well, probably easy to know that they're there. But if, you're answering, if you're answering a question to your, uh, your line manager, um, and it's about the advantages and disadvantages of activity-based management, I think, in the operational one. Um, you can go through and say, from a book, the advantages and disadvantages of this. Although, for, for what's going to earn you better marks on business skills, are saying, in our business, we've got four types of animal feed. And they've got different resource uh, usages and they've got different complexities of manufacturing, so a huge advantage of activity-based costing is that we find out how those overheads are used by the different products. So I'm actually applying it to the business context. So I know, I'm showing that I know what activity-based costing is, and I'm showing some of my business skill. All right? So that's, that's the first bit in terms of... Um, is it, remember, I'll just, I'll just go back to this. 
the, the, the case study and the, the, the overall level um, is, I've already tested, do you know your stuff on F1 and P1 and E1? All right? So the case study is much more about this rather than the, um, the you, I, would I, would, I would never plan and say that I'd expect to see a third of the exam being P1, a third of it being E1, and a third being F1. I would hope that there's a little bit of everything in there, but this doesn't tell me that that's what's going to happen. All right? So, so say with both uh, operational and management case studies, we've got very, very light touch on the financial. Very, very light. Um, so, you know, that, that's right. Now, the, the, the other part of your question, um, when we've got these examining windows, there you are. Now, in, e in each of these windows, I, I, I'm trying to remember what's been communicated and what hasn't, but in each of those examining windows, what, what, what this will be in each one, apart from February 2015, which is a week later. Week number two of the month will be the operational case study week. Week number three will be the management case study week. And week number four will be the strategic case study week. All right? So as in the, the, the full week. I mean, we, we, we have a calendar which is in final draft and it will be with you ever so shortly, a uh, mm -hmm. couple of weeks or so, I think, giving all the details on it. Right? Now, this, the window is going to be a five day window for exams <coughs> Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And when a student goes along to take a case study exam, there will be one of five versions of the exam that they'll see. So everyone will have the same pre seed material and supporting database and everything like that. Okay, so you all know that it's the MW Animal Feeds Company, if you're doing operational works, the Fly, fly jet. I could never get the name of it right. Easy fly jet. Fly. Uh, Mansfield and so on. All right. But when you come in, so so what happens? Um, if it's operational, your first task will be something related to P1, management accounting task. Okay. If it's management, it will be something to do with P2, and at strategic level, it will be something to do with E3. E3. Right, so P, P, E. <coughs> P1, P2, E3. Okay? So it will be, you know, it, it will be a decision-making task, or it will be a cost analysis task. Like, like, like the, the, the pilot has got activity-based management. Yeah? Um, but then, where, it, and again, it could be one of, you know, it's quite a big syllabus. So, there, there are five different variants of the, uh, the, the exam following the pre C. Yeah, so, so one might be short term decision making, another one might be cost analysis, uh, yeah, one might be to do with control, etc., etc. And then it will go one way or another or another. All right, so we might say, having done cost analysis, what we next want to look at is something out of F1. And then we might go back to something out of P1 before going over to E1, spending a bit more time in E1 and coming back to P1. Yeah, so there's all sorts of routes that we can go through. Um, and again, another thing that is on its, on its way is with our marketing team for, for uh, checking and tidying up, um, is a, a document that, that lists what we're calling um, dependencies 
across each of the levels. And it's something that really highlights this story of, of how the level is integrated. To say that when you've done a, 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 something out of syllabus topic E1, then you can go here, there, or anywhere. You can link into more stuff in E, you can link into stuff in P, you can link into stuff in F, and create a story of, of um, decisions and factors that a company needs to make. Right? So, yes, we will have five variants. And on Tuesday, when people turn up, they'll have, you know, it, it's not that that's a Tuesday variant and a Wednesday variant and a Thursday variant. <laughs> A Saturday variant. It was actually proposed at one point. Uh, there were a couple of concerns, one of which came from one market in particular that said, What's going to happen in my market? It wasn't here. Uh, is that there will be one or two people take a morning sitting, right? So they'll go along at eight o'clock in the morning, they'll sit there for three hours, and they'll just memorize what the tasks are. They'll come out. Then they'll meet all their friends and they'll, they'll, they'll run a course on what's on the Tuesday evening. So you'll have two people in the morning and you'll have 50 people in the evening. So, so that, 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 was, that was quite a cynical attitude. Um, and the other thing that we thought might happen on that was people look and see what happens on the Tuesday or the Wednesday or the Thursday and Friday and think that there's a process of elimination. So they'll say, this hasn't been tested, so it must be on the Saturday. So, uh, 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 so yeah, we'll go for the, the random. So you might be sitting next to somebody who's doing exactly the same sequence of events, somebody who's doing something completely different. It, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's a good bit of fun in terms of running that. Hmm. And incidentally, there will be, for the case studies, just, just in light of that, um, I, I, again, I'm not sure the exact date, but sometime over the next six weeks, I think it is, we'll have second variants of the case studies on the practice test. So on the animal feeds business and the fly jet company and the strategic one, you know, there, there will be a second um, case study so that you guys get a chance to see just just how things can deviate or maybe cross over or, or whatever happens with those. Okay, now the. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this. There's, there's been developments on the, on the, the marking, it's, again, it's not final in that one. In terms of the, in terms of the exams, uh, with, with the, the objective test, I'll talk about the, the marks. So a couple of things to explain on that one. With the case studies, again, if you're if you're doing your course planning, you will want to know this. Case study, of course, has to be marked by humans. So the script gets pinged off, um, and of course, everyone that's doing variant one has to go off to one marker or one set of markers. Variant two, variant three, variant four, five. Go off to different markers. So they're getting marked by human beings. There is a time process in there, and we will have results with students. Um, now, the exact timing will come out. I think there's, there's a meeting back in London today. I think they're going to be signing it off. Um, but it will be no later than five weeks after that case study.